someone once said that more satisfying than knowledge itself is the feeling of knowing. So today we have Professor Stangeby, who is one of the lecturers for Calculus 1, also known as MAT 194. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies. I got my bachelor's degree in math and physics from U of T, and then a master's degree in physics from U of T. And then I went to England, um, to the University, to Oxford University, in the engineering science department there, where I got a doctorate in plasma physics. And my research area is magnetic fusion energy. Tell us why you're passionate about teaching and what about instruction you enjoy the most. When I was in high school, um, some of my friends uh, asked me to help them, to tutor them in subjects like math. Well, in fact, I think it was only math and science uh, subjects. And I discovered something at that time, and that is the profound satisfaction that one can get by succeeding in explaining something, some difficult concept, or a concept that's difficult to the student, a person I'm trying to help. Um, you get a tremendous sense of satisfaction when you see the light come on. Um, it's a satis sense of satisfaction that's comparable to the sense of satisfaction that we all get when we ourselves get a concept, a difficult concept, straight. It's a, uh, a surprisingly satisfying uh, feeling. Someone once said that more satisfying than knowledge itself is the feeling of knowing. Now there's many interpretations of that. But the simplest one is just the common observation of most human beings, that it's surprisingly satisfying. But if you've got the teaching bug, then you get a separate source of satisfaction that's quite different, because it involves getting in somebody else's head, which is not the case when you yourself are getting on top of a concept. Uh, and it brings a whole different and equally profound sense of satisfaction. So I knew that from that time that I always wanted to teach, and so I found it to be the case. What should students expect in your course? Well, all students entering engineering science nowadays have had calculus in high school. That wasn't the case when I first started to teach, actually. Um, it's what I would call uh, in practical working calculus. Um, now, that's a good thing because a major component of all science and engineering uses um, calculus. You can say that perhaps you could say that it's based on calculus. Now, practical working calculus, whether at the high school level or at the university level, because it's mainly taught um, the same way, namely what I would call intuitive calculus, that is based on geometrical analogs. Um, for example, the derivative uh, is sort of defined in intuitive calculus um, by the analogy, the geometrical analogy, and geometrical analogy of the slope of a tangent to a curve and the integral by the geometrical analogy of the area under a curve. Uh, in the rigorously, in the rigorously logical approach to calculus, on the other hand, which is rarely taught, um, one proceeds from the most basic starting point that you possibly could start with in mathematics, namely you define numbers, start way, way back, um, define them by the axioms, that is the rules, that we require numbers to satisfy, which in effect, therefore, actually defines them. Um, and from there, one builds up very systematically and very carefully by proving each and every theorem, each and every step is proven in this rigorously logical approach to calculus. The first half dozen or so lectures of engineering science calculus at U of T are devoted to this rigorously logical approach. Uh, most of the course, however, proceeds um, in the way that you're familiar with from high school calculus, sort of intuitive. Uh, we don't proceed completely systematically in a rigorous way that it would simply take too much time. And the real point is to show engineering science students how to actually 
do a rigorously logical proof. Now, there are no assignments as such uh, in the course. Um, however, there are assigned problems from the textbook, which is recommended that you do, and then you have an incentive to do them, because each week there is a quiz, 20-minute quiz in each of the tutorials, uh, where there's only three questions, but those three questions are taken from the recommended list. So, you know what the questions are going to be. Uh, the main point of the quizzes is to get you going right away in this course. You can't afford to fall behind in this course. The pace is, is simply too great. Um, now, the quiz is only, each quiz is only worth 3%. Uh, so, we want to encourage students, or maybe I should say discourage students, from any thought of maybe, well, I'll take the first month off. I mean, after all, I'm away from home for the first time, and I should be able to party a bit, and so on. And, you know, if I was, you know, the master of everything, I'd make that possible. But I'm afraid it's not possible. Not in engineering science, anyway. Uh, you can't afford to fall behind. And the quizzes, these regular quizzes starting so early in the term, um, help you um, do that. They'll also be, <clears throat> so that's, that's, these quizzes all together only worth 20% of the final mark. In addition, there's two term, midterm tests, and they're each worth 15% of the final mark. And then the December final exam is worth 50%. So everything is based on exam condition type tests, if you will, uh, not turning in assignments or Thing like that. Nothing is turned in. What concepts in your course do people tend to struggle with the most? Well, it's this rigorously logical approach. Um, this occupies the first half dozen or maybe a bit more of the lectures. Uh, the derivative and the integral can be defined perfectly rigorously um, if we start by giving a rigorous definition to a concept called the limit. And that's the focus of these first few lectures. Now, most students find that this is the most challenging part of the course. Um, it's essentially new. I think probably most students of calculus in high school have probably heard the word limit and maybe had a little bit of it explained to them. But in my experience, uh, uh, to dabble in this is as good as nothing. It, you, you get nothing out of it. You either go into this in a serious way or don't bother at all. And in engineering science, we go into it in a serious way. And we, up, we take up about maybe a quarter of the lectures on it. Um, yes, the students find this hard going, and it's unfortunate this material has to come right at the beginning because it's logically necessary if we're going to proceed in a logically rigorous way. We got to start at the beginning and, you know, so the toughest part is at the beginning. Now rest assured that it'll get easier from that point on and we will proceed in the more traditional quasi-intuitive approach, but you'll always have this as the backup. It's a complementary approach. We need both approaches. So while the rigorously logical approach to calculus is without any doubt, the most challenging part of the course. Um, it is well worth it. Um, after all, calculus is used by something like half of all science and engineering, so we want it to be on an awfully solid basis. And when you've only got the basis of a geometrical analogy for your most basic of all calculus quantities, namely the derivative and the integral, well, it raises some difficult questions. In the case of the derivative, or the slope of a tangent, um, to occur, it seems that you're wanting to assign a specific value to zero divided by zero, but that value is different for different, I mean, different slopes for different cases. And similarly, the area of an integral, under an integral, the integral, the area under a curve, depending on the curve, will be a different number, but it seems that what's involved when you slice that area up into thin slices of area, each one zero, but there's an infinite number of them, and somehow zero times infinity is supposed to come out in some cases to seven, in another case 15 or so. Hmm, what is this all about? This is not sounding like we've got a very solid basis for calculus, and that's a pretty scary thing. It wouldn't matter, I suppose, if it was something that was already ever used, but there's scarcely any concept that we use more than the derivative and the integral in science and engineering. Well, this is where the rigorously logical approach uh, it becomes worth it because it puts all of that on an absolutely rock-solid basis and therefore the 
multitude of applications of calculus to different areas of science and engineering similarly, or at least in that regard, put on a rock-solid basis. So it is worth the effort. Okay, great. Thanks. Moving on, what is your favorite or the most unique thing about your course? Well, it's what I've actually been talking about. Um, I find the, the challenge of teaching and learning, the rigorous approach to calculus, is the most satisfying and motivating aspect of it. And it's what attracts me specifically to teach this course. It's because that is extremely challenging. It's, of course, extremely challenging to learn. Teaching is, by definition, that which facilitates learning. Uh, therefore, it becomes the most challenging, to me personally, the most challenging uh, topic to teach that I, at least I've ever encountered. Um, there are equally challenging ideas, but is there a more important one? I think one would be hard pressed to come up with one. I mean, after all, the applications of integrals and derivatives is so enormous, it's hard to imagine anything a bigger issue. Um, so, challenging and worthwhile. Um, when I was in first year, I'm sorry that I have to say that the rigorous, I, I was exposed to the rigorous, the logical approach to calculus, but I'm sorry to say that it was taught so poorly that I came away with essentially no understanding whatsoever of it. Well, that negative experience has actually had a very positive effect. It is what has motivated me to try to do better, and it has motivated me to all these years later. Um, so something positive can come out of something negative, and it did in this case, I think. What were some of the ways or methods that you used to help get you to where you are today? Write, write, write. Write things out. The more you write something out, the more you get it into your brain. Although I've given the same calculus lecture, each of them, I've given each of them, I don't know, many, many, many times, dozens and dozens of times. But just before I give the lecture again, I write the whole thing up. It's kind of scribbling. I even myself, I, mean, I can probably decipher it, but that's not the point. It's, it's getting into my brain. And I do it twice for each lecture, even though I've already done that all those years, just to get into my brain. Similarly, as a student, if you just sit and listen to what's said, so you're using your ear, ears, you'll get a certain amount of what's said in a, a lecture, but only a small fraction, at least if it's on anything like you're going to be bothered going to a university for, let alone a course like engineering science, then the sophistication of the ideas that are being presented there are such that if you only just listen to them, you'll only come away with some small fraction of what you witnessed. If you both listen and something's being written on the board and you're looking at it, so you're now you're using your eyes as well as your ears, well, I don't know, maybe something like twice as much goes into your brain. But if you listen and look and write, my impression is it's something like an order of magnitude more goes into your brain. I don't know if the psychologists have you know, got some explanation for that, my amateur psychologist, you know, self, would speculate that there's just so much more of your brain required to be involved when you write something, all, those, all that control of those muscles, and of course your eye involved as well, that it just puts more into your brain. So that's my main recipe for, for helping yourself to learn, is to write it out. Write it out as much as you can. What do you enjoy discussing with curious students? Oh, anything that they're curious about. But um, what I certainly do is strongly encourage students to contact me. In fact, at the start of every lecture, I write on the board and I leave it up there for the rest of the lecture. Do you want to chat? Email me. And they have my email address that's given right from the beginning on the course website. Um, and um, we can get a long way on most things that they want to talk about just through an email exchange. And when that, however, needs um, supplementing with personally getting together, well, we arrange to do that as well. So, yep, I'm delighted whenever students want to talk about whatever they want to talk about, whether it's 
areas of research, you know, where you may be going later in your career, or questions about, you know, that are related to the calculus course in your first year, in your first year experience, and concerns about, you know, are you you're worried that perhaps you're not in the right field, or you're not, you're not taking the right course, I should say. Talk about things like that, anything and everything really, uh, except I do draw the line at, at being turned into a, a tutor. That's not gonna, it's not gonna be efficient. What is your favorite memory from this course? Well, one of the, back again, I, you know, I keep talking about the rigorous and the intuitive part. Maybe I didn't talk enough about the intuitive calculus part, as if I, maybe I've even perhaps erroneously implied that it's not as important as the rigorous part, and that's absolutely not true. And in fact, I go out of my way to emphasize that we need equally the intuitive approach to calculus and the rigorously logical approach to calculus. The one without the other, either one without the other, is a much thinner thing, a much weaker thing. They complement each other. I won't go into just in what way they do, not enough time to do that here, but in the course, in the, lecture, in the lectures, I certainly do bring out why and in what way they complement each other. So the way I put it, often put it, is I say, we need two hats. Sometimes we need to put on our intuitive calculus hat, and sometimes we need to put on our rigorous calculus hat. Well, one year, the end of the lectures, some of the students presented me with this rigorous hat, my rigorous calculus hat. And they put their names on the, on the rim of it. So I guess that's maybe my, one of my favorite memories, my that's rigorous hat. That's awesome. <laughs> Do you have any closing remarks or anything else you want to say to the first years you may meet in the fall? Yes. You're having fun, and you don't know it. And it's because you're taking the whole thing too seriously. You need to relax. You need to relax. Because people in our field, math, science, engineering field, basically we get paid to have fun. Now, I know you're not getting paid yet, but don't worry. It'll come soon enough, and you get paid very well. Um, but the uh, astonishing thing is we're paid to have fun. Really. And that's not true, unfortunately, but most, you know, most people don't have that good fortune, but we do have that. Also, the nature of what we do doesn't really change. From about mid-high school, when you first start taking you know, reasonably serious math and reasonably serious science, it never then changes. I mean, what I do today, it's just, it's really the same thing. It never really changes. But what changes is my awareness that I'm having fun. I didn't have a sense of that until I was maybe, I don't know, 40 or 50. Up until then I was too, you know, furrowed brow and concerned about, you know, the earlier days it was passing exams and then getting to near, I don't know, whatever, you know. And really making much heavier weather of it than really, in retrospect, made sense. I was constantly beating up on myself with thoughts of, well, I don't really belong here, and I'm a fraud that's about to be exposed or something like this. And looking back, it was just illogical. And I must have known at some level at the time that this is too extreme. I think a lot of students are like an insider, like me. And it's not a good way to go. Because in actual fact, what we're doing is the same all the way through. And it is all fun. You just don't know that it's fun. OK. so. What I urge you to do is to bring forward in time. Don't wait till you're 50 to realize that it's all been fun. Try to bring it back, you know, further. Bring it back further. And to sort of ease your mind a little bit about all this stress I gotta pass and I gotta get good marks and all the rest of it. Well, yeah, there's something to that, but you can go too extreme in that. How important were the grades that you got in grade nine and grade ten? Marks that you got. How much difference did it make to where you ended up and what university you get into? Basically, you got grade nine and grade ten on the house. Okay, you kind of get first and second year kind of on the house. Now you can't goof off so much you fail. And then side already said you can't fall behind. All right, but there's also not any point in going, you know, putting the pedal right to the floor. Hold that, and you're going. You will need that in third year and fourth year. Yeah, okay, but 
What's the point of going full tilt right at your maximum? You're just going to burn yourself out. No, no, save that a little bit. Save that. You can relax a little bit. Even in engineering science at U of T, yes. You can relax more than you probably think. Um, you wouldn't be in, in engineering science if you weren't an overachiever, an overly conscientious. Uh, so you can afford, unlike perhaps a lot of people your own, your age, <laughs> who aren't in NSI, you can afford to relax a little bit. And it's going to be just fine.